So we will continue with the LACNIC Tenka Forum with very interesting presentations that were spe uh, specially chosen for today. Let me just remind you that we will not have an open mic for this session, but please, we want to encourage everyone to ask questions in the Q&A session, is Q&A panel. And without further ado, let me introduce Paul Bernard, who will have 20 minutes for his presentation that is leveraging the IoT Honeypot Network for the LACNIC region. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Welcome, welcome, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to take part in this session. Thank you, Andrea, for your introduction. And what I will try to do is to do a very, well, provide a very brief overview with two sections. The first one, tell you the progress made in this very interesting project that we have been implementing in the last couple of months. And also, I hope this uh, is useful to really encourage all participants to join the project, which is one of our main objectives so we can grow our network and how to leverage the data and the information that we are now collecting and using about the the network of honeypot sensor network for the LACNIC region. So how did this come about? Well, in our call, the, the FRIDA program last year, we submitted the project together with Shadow Server. Many of you might know Shadow Server those of you who don't know it, it's a nonprofit organization headquartered in the UK. And for many years, they've been working in cybersecurity, especially focusing on, the, on data collection for the systems in place online around the world. This, this data, they usually share data with different security groups where we might uh, be participating. And we have really identified the need to really receive this data to be more understanding of our systems and any vulnerabilities we might face or security issues and how to prevent any attempted attack or un undesired situations that we might face. We have a great relationship with Shadow Server. We have had so for quite a few years as uh, we've been working with, uh, with FIRST, the International Forum since 2017, the Security Forum. Um, Really, before that, we had worked with Shadow Server, they provided data, and really thanks to that exchange in the first forum and the LACNIC forum, of course, where we always try to be very active participants, so we really had the chance to bring this project to life, which it is part of the internet stability and security of the FRIDA project, and basically the aim is to deploy a honeypot network in Latin America and the Caribbean. I mean, this is not new. Honeypot ne networks are already in place. Shadow Server has an international honeypot server, and we would be joining it through this project. We are integrating in Latin America and the Caribbean this uh, network that uh, Shadow Server already has in place. And this is very interesting. Why? Because not only we are going to use our own information from the Latin America and Caribbean region, both from source to target, these sources are the distance sensors are detecting traffic coming out from Latin America and the Caribbean to anywhere in the world, in addition to the traffic coming to us from other parts of the world. The sensors will physically be located in Latin America and the Caribbean region. So thanks to this project, we've begun working with one objective in mind, one, to install 50 sensors in 15 countries. So in Latin America and the Caribbean region, we are going to try to implement 50 sensors in at least 15 countries. To date, we have already deployed, actually we have deployed 33 sensors to date, you can see 21 plus one 
in my slides because we already are in contact with other national research and investigation networks like Seria, actually it's my uh, home organization. And since we have great relationships with different institutions the NRENs, as they are called in English worldwide, we've been able to implement at least one sensor in Africa, in Morinette, in Mozambique. That's why I wrote 29 plus one, because that one sensor, even though it's not in Latin America and Caribbean region, it is still uh, having direct impact on us because we are doing it through our management services. We've implemented this in 17 countries and I am including Mozambique. And in Latin America and the Caribbean region, we have already covered almost every country. We are missing Nicaragua, we are missing Venezuela. We've been working very closely in, in trying to get sponsored and to get them on board uh, and get companies on board, private organizations or institutions across these countries. We do not have, we are not in, present in Bolivia yet either, and we will be very interested to do so. Of course, we have more active participation in some countries than in others. We might have more than one sensor in some countries. That's why the number of sensors pretty much doubles the number of countries we have already settled in. But as I said before, one of the main advantages of this is that we are able to collect data at international level, even though the objective of our project is a Latin America sensor network, we are really uh, integrating a global network of sensors. Therefore, we have access to traffic and to information and detail, commitment indicators and so on for this activity that is being uh, implemented against the honeypots that have been installed worldwide. I'm sorry to interrupt, Paul. I don't want to take time from your presentation, but you know, we cannot see your slides on screen. So you might not be sharing your screen. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, 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 I thought you made reference to your slides, but you were not sharing your screen. Okay, so very quickly, there you can see my presentation slides. So what I said earlier, shadow server and the project that we already have in place together with Syria in the implementation of the of the project. We have installed a network of sensors, as I said before, and you can see on screen the Latin American map and the Caribbean map. Some countries um, we've already implemented sensor in some countries, as you can see in that map very clearly the places in our region where we have yet to uh, install sensors. And as I said before, one of our main objectives would be for, I mean, everyone who's now participating in this technical forum and in the LACNIC event in general, would want to collaborate and to become interested in taking part in our, in our project, remembering those objectives that we have in mind. As I said before, to collect information about these attempted attacks or this malicious activity that has happened uh, in the direction of the equipment installed in our region. This is one of our main items because, uh, well, as I said before, Shadow Server already has been collecting this type of information for many years, but this information does not necessarily come from equipment that is that are physically installed in our region, in the LAC region. In addition, other benefits, other additional benefits that had not maybe really been thought of since the beginning is that we are obtaining information from the uh, traffic coming to Latin America and from La the LAC region. So we've been able to go even beyond of what we had thought uh, to do at the beginning. So we are very pleased and very excited about it. That's why we are trying to find more support from other institutions or companies that might wanna join our, our initiative. A second objective is to equip organizations with uh, information that they might fi find useful about their network. And this is important and connected to the to the item before, because although we are collecting information from other type of systems or other type of providers or equipment that might be feeding into that information, and even though it is important, 
but that information would uh, it is being collected through sensors that are or will be located in our region we want to raise awareness and this is very important and we want this information to be visibly visible more visible and really to become more acquainted with the activities and traffic in our region i will show you some views uh in a couple of slides of different information we are already processing and we and the next objective is to integrate or become part of other organizations and integrate new equipment to really share uh to have shared benefits what type of shared benefits for well, those institutions that are collaborating with us we will provide them with the possibility to share this information so what i mean is that originally based on the design of the network we do not necessarily have information to the data going through the sensor because even though the sensor might be in your network we might not have direct access to that sensor because they collect traffic and they send it to a collection system now as you can see on screen the organizations that are collaborating with our project are the choose to do so we are already sending or forwarding that uh, full set of information to them that means that we are not just sending a report we are not just sending a dashboard or a data package but rather we are sending the full uh, package the full information with all the details from a to z of the traffic that is going through their own sensors even for some education centers or institutions, we have worked with the La Plata University, for example, to try to eventually sign an agreement through which they might have access to the full data set for all sensors, not only their own sensors, so they can use these for research purposes and to, well, really to analyze and to leverage these technologies to the most, such magic learning, deep learning, big data, and so on. So all of these new techniques and new technologies that are in place and very much used in the education field, so they can leverage that to use it as a supply a data set. There's a great deal of data to be able to, to use well not only the data but to be to to implement or to use algorithm processes or techniques to sort of come up with a prevention intelligence or a prevention strategy through automated system we can detect traffic that follows certain characteristics and therefore we might be able to issue warnings for example, if I see certain communication coming from a country in the LAC region or coming to or from our region, we might be able to notify those warnings or alerts. In Panama, for example, we've uh, been surprised by the fact that this visibility that we are now having that this traffic is having we've noticed that in panama and this is not this is a, a screenshot we did on on monday may the 10th so you can see that that there's great prevalence in in panama through the origin of communication so would be very interesting to assess maybe with equipment located in that country and the same the, the same could be done in an, in other countries as well this dashboard that you can see on screen is the view of the of the activity that we had in one day so this is one day's worth of work so we had about 12.5 million events so there's quite substantial significant traffic that we are detecting and that we are monitoring and approximately 103,000 ip uh um ip addresses different ip origin addresses so from these different origins we have received such connections or events that were detected by our system so as part of the information that we are receiving and we are processing through different honeypots that are installed with the sensors when one institution decides to collaborate with our project depending on the characteristics of the equipment we will install a collection or a set of honeypot that could be the minimum one two maybe four or six depending on their own features or characteristics so these type of honeypots are programmed to receive and process certain information 
Some are more specialized in SCH traffic, others in trying to emulate certain type of communication equipment. And that's what we can see right here at the bottom of my screen. Some of these equipment can be more directly identify as IoT. And these honeypots, ACNAS in particular, and this is one of the projects that is uh, um, carried out by Shadow Server. It's shown showing itself to attackers or to those incoming connections and simulating a, a different type of equipment. So it's not just a uh, specific hunting pot uh, type, but rather showing itself as it were a DVR equipment, as a web camera or a router or an email server or different types of equipment, even showing different types of brands and models. We thought that was very interesting and it's something that you can see at the bottom of my screen, at the graph at the bottom of my screen. Then the protocols to your left, SSH is probably the main one or one of the main ones, but interestingly so, VRC is one of those protocols that are more consistently springing up. This is something that really we have just started to try to, to understand how traffic is behaving in our region. We can also geographically locate both uh, source or target connections, origin and target connections, origin connections, as you can see, it's on the less, it's probably more, more prevalent in, in Panama. You have two minutes left. Yes. So in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, Panama is the one that strikes our attention the most. We have, for example, CVEs, certain types of vulnerabilities that we have detected. Depending on the type of, of connection activities, we can see commands that have been executed by attackers and so on. So let me just invite you all to participate. The degree of difficulty in implementing this type of honeypot is very low. It's not necessary to have much hardware available. We can use uh, VMware, KVM, or Xen, Ubuntu 18.04, one gigabyte RAM, 10 to 20 GBs, and four public IPv4 that do not need to be filtered with two is uh, just fine. One is used for control and the other one for the honey bot itself. We do not need a lot of uh, very high uptime levels or support either. So really, we do not have to, uh, our requirements are not very complicated. We do not, uh, to powerful machines, if they ever fail, it doesn't matter. We will notify and you can have it up and running again. And of course, we can simulate a normal and real scenario of equipment that might eventually fail as well. So please uh, visit our website, sensores.lat. And if you have any further questions or any observations, we usually do video conferences to clear out different doubts. And you have my email address and phone number on screen. If you have any further questions, please let me know. Thank you, Paul, for your presentation. We have a few minutes before the next presentation. So let me um, remind you that you can use the Q&A for questions. I don't know if there are any questions right now. Rodrigo Peña is asking, is the honeypot ethical or virtualized? for any networks that might want to include one, either one actually. Not long ago, we were given a physical machine in equipment that was not in use. And that's the one they gave us. It has much more capacity than we need. It's really working just fine. And, and we appreciate it. Most machines are virtual machines though. Of course, uh, let me say that I forgot to say this before, that those who can maybe not contribute the equipment or they do not have any equipment available, since there are certain subsidies or grants provided by the program, we could even pay for that equipment ourselves. 
Thank you. Demian Desile has a question and he says, I see that the page is on IPv4. Do Honeypot only use IPv4 or do they also consider IPvC attacks? Only IPv4 for now, but Shadow Server is already working on the IPvC stack to try to detect traffic as well. Edu Preve has another question. In uh, in one day, we had approximately 12.5 million events. So there's quite significant traffic that we can look at, monitor, and we are working in that sense. Approximately 103,000 uh, different IP addresses. Could you please elaborate on that? Yes, actually, whenever there is a connection attempt in any of the sensors, any sensors in our network will will detect that attempt, and not only the attempt, but the activity that might be underway. So if it's a CCH type of connection, we can only see the attempt, the user, and the password that was used to get in, but also we can record the internal activity, for example, which commands were executed. I didn't show this because it's going a bit more in detail, but we could from that obtain intelligence as to how they are trying to attempt uh, these attacks in equipment. We can see the commands, the scripts, how they run in, which techniques they are actually using for uh, that activity in particular. So these 12.5 million events refer to each one of these messages or activities that the sensors record. The different origin IP addresses means where these connections are coming from, probably infected equipment or actual people that are behind that and attempting, maybe not necessarily an attack or malicious activity, it could be an export activity as well. Thank you, Paul. There are no further questions. Thank you all. Thank you, Paul, for your presentation. And thank you, Kim, for reading the questions to us. We are now going to the next presentation of Maximo Candela. Telephone Corporation Entity. Él nos contará sobre una estrategia para mantener su geolocalización. Máximo, cuentas con 20 minutos para tu presentación. The next speaker is Máximo Candela, who will be speaking about a strategy to maintain, maintain geolocation updated. Perfect. Can you see the presentation correctly? Sí, la vemos bien. That's it. Um, hello, my name is Massimo Candela. I'm a senior software engineer at NTT. And uh, today I would like to uh, show you uh, a strategy that you can use to uh, keep your geolocation up to date and correct your geolocation. Uh, this is a strategy that we are um, also um, using identity and more and more companies are uh, joining this uh, effort and I hope you can also benefit uh, from it. Um, so um, the uh, presentation uh, it's based on our draft at the IETF which is finding and using geofield data. Currently is it, it is in a, an advanced status at the IETF. Uh, my co-authors are Randy, Warren, and Russ, and you can, of course, find more detail in this in the draft. Um, but let's say, what is the problem? Um, where um, IP geolocation, it is important because when the IP geolocation is wrong, your customers will complain that they cannot access some content uh, in their region. Um, or for troubleshooting or for research. And uh, when the geolocation is wrong, um, unfortunately, there is no uh, central repo. There is no common strategy. There is nothing really defined on how to fix it properly. And there, there is also no authoritative data. What you have instead is a set of data sets uh, distributed that they uh, are produced by various companies like uh, geolocation providers, but also uh, by, for example, content providers, they have their own copy uh, with maybe their own uh, fixes in it. And uh, it is a heterogeneous set. And when you want to fix it, you have to contact many organizations. Sometimes you don't also are sure where is the origin of that error. 
Um, sometimes uh, among the organizations that people can try to contact, there are RIRs like LACNIC, RIF, but these are not in charge for your geolocation. So there is really nothing they can do for that. Uh, so this is uh, a part of the list of the uh, providers that you can uh, contact. These are for sure the most uh, uh, famous one, uh, but there are many more. And also in this list is not including the, um, uh, the, the content providers or whatever other organization that they have a copy of this uh, data. So you can clearly see now that if this happens often, uh, it, it starts to be uh, an overhead on your operations. So what we propose is a simple procedure based on three steps. Uh, the step number one, you create a CSV file. The CSV file is a text file. Uh, in, basically in this CSV file, uh, for each uh, uh, prefix that you want to geolocate, you create one row, uh, like this one that you see in bold here. Uh, the row is like prefix or IP, comma, country code, comma, region code, comma, city, comma. This is the, uh, um, the sequence. And you do this for each prefix or IP that you want to geolocate. This format, it's uh, uh, called GeoFeed and it's described in the standard uh, uh, in the RFC 8805. Uh, we build on top of, uh, uh, of this format uh, because this format, it is uh, currently well, uh, uh, a lot of uh, companies use it already and basically all geolocation providers already adopt this format. So it, it is a format that works already. Uh, step number two, uh, you take this file and you put it, you serve it somewhere in your web page or on GitHub, okay? Possibly over HTTPS. Uh, so you have here two examples of uh, files on GitHub. One is our file of entity and the other one is of T-Mobile. And uh, the only thing that you need is a URL where this file is accessible. Uh, now, step number three, uh, you go in your RIR portal, uh, you find the INNAM that uh, contains the prefixes that you want to geolocate, and you add a remark. Uh, this remark has to have the string exactly like shown here, geofeed space URL, okay? Uh, Basically, all RIRs use INNAM and remarks, except for ARIN, that they use net ranges and comments, but it's basically the same thing, just changes the name of the object and property. So by doing this, uh, by adding the remark, what, the, what you did is uh, you did two important things. The first thing is you made those files discoverable. So instead of sending it by email or something, you made this file discoverable, and basically you allowed uh, people that they are interested to crawl and fetch those data. And the second important thing that you did is that you linked it from the INNAM, so you made it uh, easy to verify the ownership, basically almost uh, transparently. And we will see a bit more about this. And um, an important, basically the idea is that if you can add the remark, uh, then you also are authoritative for that uh, resource. Uh, and uh, last information that's useful is that you, in, uh, you can point multiple INNAMs to the same geofeed file. That's actually what we are currently doing, where we are, uh, uh, we have one file with all our prefixes and multiple INNAM pointing to that file. Uh, so now let's see how uh, you can do it in practice. Uh, some an example. This is an example of this is our file. Just a few beginning, a uh, few lines of our file, and um, you see, as I said before, the prefix, country, region, city. Uh, but you can also just say the country, for example, uh, and, and like here in this case, Hong Kong. Uh, so you can actually decide what information, what level you want to provide. Also, you can also don't provide anything. You just put prefix, uh, comma, empty spaces, which means that you don't want to geolocate. Uh, now, um, creating this file is particularly simple, but if you uh, want more information, I leave this slide. You can find it on the LACNIC website in the PDF. Uh, which uh, gives you URLs of uh, the ISO website where you can essentially go and uh, check your uh, and, and search for a country and find the correct uh, ISO code to use. 
Now here is an example on how you can do that in uh, the uh, LACNIC uh, uh, portal, which is uh, MILACNIC. And thank you to the uh, LACNIC staff for providing the uh, screenshot. Uh, so you go in uh, the resource, the INNAM that you want to, uh, to uh, geolocate, you go in the remark uh, button, which is here at the bottom right. And it opens a thing like this, where you have this field, you put one line, what we said before, geofeed, the URL to the file. And after when you save, when you will do a WHOIS query, what you will have is essentially the remark that points to the file. So basically what you said here is that if you want to geolocate if the IPs that they are inside this INNAM, inside this range, you have to go to this file. Um, now, after you did these steps, you can uh, test uh, immediately. Uh, you can go and download this application, which is uh, compiled for Mac and Linux. Uh, you do the options minus T and the options minus T and with the prefix, and that will tell you what file has been downloaded and what information the file contains about that uh, prefix. Uh, why GeoFeed? Um, well, the format, it is uh, extremely flexible. There is nothing so flexible uh, like a GeoFeed for geolocation, which basically allows you to geolocate um, single IPs or entire prefixes or multiple prefixes because the longest prefix match is what is used. So you can geolocate a slash 16 and provide more information for a slash 24. And you can also geolocate at whatever level you wish. Uh, this means that inside the file, you can, as we saw before, provide nothing or, or country or city. Uh, and uh, important to remember, you don't need to create an uh, um, INNAM for each, uh, um, for each sub prefix uh, uh, that you want to geolocate. Uh, so basically, the, 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 the file can have more granularity. So basically, you need just an INNAM that is going to contain uh, the prefixes that they are in your uh, in your file. Um, so important information is that uh, we are not trying to replace geolocation provider because they have an important role in validating the information provided and in distributing that information. What we are trying to do is to ease and automate the communication with them. Um, also, we are trying to provide a, a defined way on how to validate these files. Uh, because at the moment there is no clear path and everybody does something different, which can create a lot of ambiguities on how this uh, data is processed. And also some approaches for validating uh, ownership are a bit original and unsafe. Uh, so the basically uh, our goal is that also not only on how to publish, but how to uh, retrieve safely this file, which is descri uh, described better in the draft, but essentially already by linking it from the INNAM, you provide some assurance of uh, the ownership of uh, the prefixes that you are geolocating. And of course, uh, the uh, whoever fetches this data has to start from the INNAM, go to the file, and has to read in the file only the prefixes that they are contained in that INNAM. Uh, and additionally, in case of weak RPSL authentication, um, basically there is, um, there is an optional. Recomendo uh, útil, agradável, uma implementação simples a, dentro de um escopo bem específico, pensando so, num equipamento de borda, CPE, there is, uh, e audio um equipamento in. que eu precisasse fazer Sorry. a configuração de acordo com um, boas práticas. So, então, in, in eu selecionei weak, três fabricantes, uh, 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 e de acordo what, com as particularidades uh, de cada fabricante, append, eu fui uh, criando uh, esses uh, playbooks. Uh, uh, a, a digest uh, of esse... the main body of the file signed with the uh, private key of the uh, RPI certificate fazer... uh, covering that prefix. That is optional, it's an additional e... safety uh, procedure. Uh, so how to consume GeoFeed? Uh, well, there is this application here uh, that you can use, which essentially what it does, it, uh, it uses uh, WHOIS dumps. Uh, which we suggest uh, basically downloads all the uh, link to the geofits. It takes the geofits and uh, creates, uh, validates and creates a big geofit file uh, globally for, for all the, the merge of all the geofits find, found. Um, and if uh, geolocation providers already are supporting uh, uh, geofits, then um, the only thing that they have to do is to run an application similar to this and import that file uh, periodically. 
Um, so my presentation is over. And uh, if you have uh, questions, uh, uh, I think this is the moment. But anyway, I'm going to be also available in uh, my uh, uh, email and uh, for uh, um, on my um, Twitter, if you would like. Okay. Muchas gracias. Massimo, por tu Thank you, Massimo, for your presentation. We will now start with the questions for Massimo. Kevin, do we have any questions for Massimo? Yes, we have a question here. I'm going to read it out in the original language. From Valentina, uh, what is the minimum prefix to geolocate? What is the minimum prefix to geolocate? Mm, there is no minimum prefix, uh, so it's uh, it, your prefix. You can geolocate your prefixes. So if you uh, you have a slash sixteen, you can geolocate whatever you want in the slash slash sixteen. You can geolocate up to a single IP. So you can go from geolocating the entire slash sixteen uh, to geolocating the single IP. In the same file, uh, the longest prefix match is what uh, will be done. So you can also just provide a slash uh, 16 and also a slash 24. And basically, uh, you, you can say, oh, this slash 16 is in Italy, uh, but this specific slash 24 inside the slash 16 is in particular is in Rome. And you can even provide, I don't know, except this IP, which is somewhere else. So you can provide uh, whatever uh, more specific or less specific you want. As long as the parent item num includes that prefix. Thanks, Massimo. We also have a question from Ricardo Patara. Uh, he asks, is it safe to say that IP geolocation issues are being solved with the usage of geofeed data? I mean, are there organizations using this information to geolocate IP addresses? Uh, that's actually a, a really good question. So at the moment, the format in, in itself it is already used by every geolocation providers and also by many content providers. They accept that as a form. So um, basically what we are trying to do is to replace the fact that you have to send it by email, okay? Or, or, or things like this. So we are trying to make it automatic that whatever geolocation provider can find those files without you chasing them or without you trying to understand where it is from. Uh, at the moment there are three main geolocation providers already implementing it. There is one uh, that uh, various others are already also experimenting and implementing with it. One it's implementing all of, only for IPv6. Uh, what we can tell you is that for us, uh, it is uh, currently working pretty well. It is already reducing a lot the overhead uh, that we are uh, doing to correct these uh, prefixes. And I, and I, we are in contact with many geolocation providers, and I believe that uh, uh, it will uh, grow even more. Thanks, Massimo. In terms of, of identify people uh, making questions, there are no more questions uh, at the moment. So back to you, Andrea. Muchas gracias, Kevin. Gracias, Massimo, por tu presentación. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Massimo, for your presentation. We now have the next speak speaker, Hugo Salgado from Nick Chile. He's going to put up uh, the malpractice of using local host in DNS zone. Hugo, Hugo, you have 10 minutes for your presentation. Perfect. Hola, buenas. Hello. Hola. Bueno, mi nombre es Hugo Salgado, yo soy de Nick Chile. My name is Hugo Salgado. I work at Nick Chile, the CEO registry. I also belong to the DNES LACNAC, which to which you are also invited to sign up at the end of the URL. I will speak about a problem we usually have when using local host type of names in, in public domains. It is a problem caused by habit, I would say. It's not 
a critical risk right now, but it is important that we understand that it's no longer necessary to do so and to really stop doing it in the future. So I will explain why this is a problem and why this is not recommended. What do I mean by local host? It's about that habit that we have had for a while of using a, a name by default called localhost dot domain for uh, oh, 127.001 IP, I look back. At some point that was recommended to do online, but it's now turned into a problem. As I said, this used to be a good practice in 1993 that was standardized even having a local host name in all of the zones, we thought it was a good practice. Actually, by default, some software, some DNS uh, software use that, different examples, and in templates, really, and that's what's most important. At some People did it at the time, and it's being passed on into the future, into current times. What was the idea back then is that the local query, the local host would go to the public DNS, it would be answered accordingly. I don't know if you are familiar with the search list. If I locally write a name, a tag, I can, I can add a suffix and that could leak into the public internet. So people wanted to use a local host in all of the known areas because if it leaked, it would be replied with the 127.001. However, very quickly, we, we saw problems coming up and three years later, that recommendation was no longer needed and it was considered this was not a good option anymore. But as we all know, whatever has been online will stay online forever. So out of habit, as I said before, there are different zones that are following in this tradition, or there are some examples that are still online, they're still out there. And well, as I said before, this sort of continues to drag on, and this is data that we uh, collected out of 700,000 domains, the .cl. In 2017, we had about 27% of the domains that start continue to use the local host, the loopback. And in red, you can see addresses that did not have the loop back. These are just the wild card areas and therefore only respond to any name. In 2021, we did an assessment again and we are doing better, about 16%. But this has this problem has become modernized. We not only have the 127.001, but the 2.201. So it's probably something that will stay for a while. That's why it is important that I can tell you about it and I hope people will stop doing it. Why is it a bad, bad idea? Well, first, usability. The search list is a, a problem on itself. We consider that this affects consistency, but there's no a single way of doing things. And actually studies show, and this is a 2013 study that showing the operational uh, operation system, really the search list works in different ways and even different browsers. The browsers behave differently. At least back then, there are no recent studies, but I suspect it hasn't changed a lot. Even from a usability standpoint, it is very important that we, that any behavior stays as close to the user as possible. So if I am creating an app to help users uh, use uh, tags without a, a, a domain name at the end, it's important that it remains as close to the user as possible. The interface, the front end, the app to the operating system, what is important is that from the operator system to the resolver going online to the network, I hope that all of the names are qualified. And I mean that they're complete because at that point, I cannot longer speak about the intention of the user. And hopefully by that time, everything remains complete. In addition to usability, 
uh, problems, there is localization. So a local host needs to be local. So standards, software standards for a long time have said that a server, a, a DNS stab server should automatically respond with a loopback if they receive a local host uh, request and full resolvers should respond with an NX domain, which doesn't exist. So it's not longer correct saying that a resolver will respond with the 127.001. Even that draft paper that you can see at the bottom of the screen addresses this issue in particular, meaning that the resolver will respond with an NX domain, which is the normal response if you do not have a local uh, a local host. The graph on screen shows, I don't know if you can see it very well, but it looks the queries to the server, number seven or eight, you'll see the local host with 318 queries per second. So a local host, outside the local server gets to the resolver and the resolver would go to the, uh, to the server, back to the server. Finally, there are security issues that have been reported at some point. I don't know if these were real attacks or theoretical attacks, but people were concerned. Users were concerned as there could be a cookie leak or theft. Local hosts should really consider their area, looking at different registries and maybe an IP that is out of our control or maybe in, it's no longer in use. There's a, a real example. This is a real example out of privacy. I just changed the name of the zone. Sometimes we use external services, for example, a test in, in Amazon. And at some point I stopped using it. I no longer use this service, but I kept the name of the zone. So the risk here is that a while later, Amazon or whatever the company is might use that IP address or that name, and we would be using that name in our in our zone and, and using an external IP. So that would be all. This was very short. So the recommendation is to eliminate the name local host from your zones, which is what well, superfluous, of course, if you want to use the name local host, you can, but what I mean is that we should break that habit that sometimes it's not really, really clear why that habit developed by default. So that would be all. I don't know if there are any questions on screen. You can see our LACNOG uh, site. You are welcome to, to join us or to, we can continue the, the discussion there. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Hugo. I will, uh, let me remind you that you can write your questions in the Q&A section. Also, please write your name when asking questions. In the meantime, Hugo, if you can write down your email address in the, in the chat box, if people want to maybe write you directly. Yes, I'm also in the Discord group, so you can also contact me through there. No problem. Great. There are about uh, 350 people already participated in Discord. I don't know if there are any questions or maybe comments in our in our chat room. Any anything, Andrea? No, we have no questions or comments right now. Okay, great. So if you do have questions later on, you can ask through Discord or Hugo's email address. Thank you, Hugo. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you, Andrea. Welcome to this new block of the of Latinx Technical Technical Forum. We're going to have four presentations, and the four speakers are the four women that participated in Latinx Monet Mentoring uh, Program from 2020-2021. I'll introduce them one by one as uh, set in the agenda. So now I give the floor to each of them. Uh, they will uh, give their presentation and then we'll have a few minutes for questions and comments for each of them separately. So let me start 
with Vanessa de Oliveira Melo. She's from Brazil. She's a, a network and a security engineer. She's going to share her presentation. It's a technical work on network automation that she developed together with her mentor. In this case, it was Carlos Martinez. So go ahead, Vanessa. Hello, welcome you all. It's a pleasure to have you here. Do you see it? Yes? Good. So I'm going to tell you a bit more about the um, configuration of the networks and I'm going to, the motivation was to provide a common for network operator who don't have experience with uh, automation tools, especially those that don't have uh, too many tools with automation tools. So I thought uh, of uh, putting uh, this, uh, the useful with the pleasant together to provide a playbook and Ansible with simple implementation in order to provide the automation of anti-proofing configurations with good practices. So I, I proposed uh, the three by those vendors. At my laboratory, if I I tried, uh, even if it was not open source, I wanted it to be free of charge so that it would be affordable. So I used uh, the Python uh, 2.7, um, Ansible 2.9, and uh, when uh, um, network uh, operator at users configuration, they wouldn't have to worry about uh, uh, Python 3 or an Ansible 3. That is, they I wanted to avoid the difficulty of uh, um, having those problems. And another configuration is that uh, I tried to get an external access to the internet to uh, um, uh, put them uh, in uh, my files and to do some updating in my equipment. Another interesting thing is always to be very careful about security, not to put any uh, passwords or users in these files that go to the GitHub because they're going to stay there open. So you must always be careful to use uh, another um, key. Then at the end, I'm going to give you a link for a video because I'm going to focus more on Juniper. And uh, well, um, we have the configurations for Cisco and uh, Microtik, but Juniper is very, very interesting because it can use the templates uh, of uh, change tasks, etc. So I have uh, this uh, focused on Juniper, but in the article, I also offer it for Cisco and Microtip. So both me and my mentor, we were worried about the possibility of seeing whether there was return. We directed the code, for instance, in this case, we put in the slide, I check in the Juniper device, if I have it, if it, if it fails, if I don't have that list of prefixes, I send it to the equipment and if uh, it's successful, then I'm going to create this list of prefixes that is the chaining of these uh, templates. Um, in the case uh, when, uh, of Juniper, I installed this in the Ubuntu server. The module of Juniper, uh, Junos, is um, the, uh, is, uh, um, you need uh, to download uh, the, uh, Junius, Junus, Easy, NC, and NC client. So these uh, configurations are in uh, e e SSH, and uh, you need to do a root configure because when you configure the automation of a Linux uh, server, you can also only use the SSH, but in the case of a network device, you need to have another layer of communication. In this case, I use the NCOM. That's why I had to do this configuration that is standard. Very interesting things, or at least uh, all the modules that uh, are used of Juniper, they operate with exclusive mode in the Juniper module. 
and if a network operator uses a configuration they won't be able to do it if it's executing this um, and if an error occurs in the playbook and needs to be interrupted the editing mode may become st stuck you always must read the manual so as not to find any surprises if you get trapped uh, in the configuration because of some error in the execution then you can solve this uh, process in juniper itself there are some connectors that can be uh, used i use netconf because it has a better interaction with the modules except for junior scp that was also a very good configuration that i had to do because of the ansible 2.9 and the previous one there was a situation that said that the local connection provider was deprecated but this uh, uh, subtree tribute was required. So I needed a local connection. I had to use either Ansible 3 or I would have the problem of not being able to update it. So I had some options to do that. I tried with the connection network CLI or the wait for, but I ruled it out because I lost uh, power because it wouldn't support it. So in this case, I chose uh, to separate it into two playbooks, and it was very good because I could separate, I do this with main YAML to do a local connection. And the main task is I use this. And uh, let me show it so for you to see. Here you'll see the execution. I have these two screens. In this screen, I'm showing that I show Juniper's MX with a uh, show configuration. I didn't do any configurations as I told you. And I have these returns here where I check in Juniper if these uh, lists of prefixes exist. And I feel I receive a return of failures because they, they don't exist. And in the wait for is an expected failure. So I ignore it. I change the registry uh, to and uh, how do I receive the fails? Uh, as I receive the this, I need to check uh, the configuration of the template. Now let's move forward. And when I show, I put show configure again, there it shows me all the configurations, the logons, uh, the blockade of uh, port 25, for instance. And when I execute it again, I execute the template once again, here I will see the return of the prefix list that do exist. And as they do exist, I can skip the rest of the tasks. And when I execute shell configuration again, we can see that there were no more changes. That is, we had the confirmation of the, uh, the um, uh, impotency executing the file with no problem. So here I leave uh, the links. Uh, and that has an article of the social media. And I also leave some time open for questions if you have any. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you. Now, let's wait a second to see whether anybody has any questions in the Q&A. Mariela, are there any questions? Hello, Laura. Well, there are no questions so far. We are waiting Maybe uh, maybe somebody in the audience has questions. We have a comment in uh, the chat. It says, uh, congratulations, uh, Vanessa. Excellent presentation. Oh, thank you. Yes, and here there is another comment. Very good presentation. Well, yes, and now we just received a question in the Q&A panel. And the question is in Spanish. Vanessa, have you tried in vendors with, without NetConf? Yes, thank you for the question, Rodrigo. Indeed, I, I tested uh, yes, uh, with, uh, and uh, it worked very well. And in my critique, uh, I also use the same tool. There are no more questions, Laura, no more questions. 
Very good. Excellent, Vanessa. Vanessa's presentation is in the agenda of the event, so you can go and share it. Well, now we go on with the next speaker. The next speaker is Maria Jesus Cresci. She is from Uruguay. She's a telematic engineer, and we are going to see uh, her work. It's called Software Protocols and Platforms uh, uh, for the Effective Development of IoT. Her mentor was Marcela Sky. So welcome, uh, Marcela. Hello, Laura. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. So I'm going to share the screen. Can you see it? Can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay. So thank you for introducing me. First, I wanted to thank LACNIC for giving me this opportunity and for giving me the mentoring opportunity and giving me the space to share my research. And I especially wanted to thank my mentor, who was mentioned, Marcela, for her time for collaboration and uh, the way she guided me uh, throughout uh, my study. Today, I'm going to speak of the technologies recommended for the Internet of Things and to show you a vision of the IoT uh, uh, defined by a software that I call software defined IoT. So I separated it into these uh, topics, first to show the objective of this work, then to define uh, legacy IoT or traditionally structure, how, what are the uh, communication technologies used in IoT, what is a software-defined uh, network, and the proposals of an SD-IoT. Well, according to Cisco's research, um, the Internet of Things is defined as the point in time where more things uh, and objects are connected than people. So this uh, group understands uh, that that was uh, seen between uh, uh, 2008 and 2010. They estimated that there would be 50 billion uh, um, uh, there would be 7.6 billion people connected and uh, and 50 billion uh, devices. What is the Internet of Things? It allows to integrate uh, objects of all kinds with people to, to use uh, the uh, uh, to benefit of uh, social, uh, economic and environmental things. The objective of this research that I conducted is to identify the protocols and solutions that are adequate for areas where they re require implementation of sensors and devices for IoT monitoring, and where there's nil or very scarce uh, uh, coverage of any type. And also this designing an IoT uh, solution divided by software for a massive uh, network. So what is the traditional uh, infrastructure. There are different layers. First, we have the devices that are sensors that are capable of detecting and measuring uh, uh, physical magnitude and to pass it to uh, the. And then we have the gateways that is obtaining that and uh, passing it to the network. The internet para hacer llegar esa información un servidor central que ese servidor send that information to the central server which could be in a data center or the cloud etc and then the applications that allow us to see the data and make decisions do analytics automate make processes automatic and endless different uses for IoT applications as we have management and security for all of these devices. Sensors and the gateway, there is a number of technologies that are recommended depending on the specific scenario, different factors to consider when doing an IoT implementation or for example, the cost of the node, the cost of the network, the uh, lifetime of the batteries, the bandwidth that we need per sensor, latency, coverage, range, 
etc. So not all of the protocols that are available right now will match these factors simultaneously in a cost effective manner. So there are two big platforms that we usually study. These are LoRa and Narrowband IoT, which are the two um, leading technologies online, let's say, but both have different qualities, technical qualities that are specific for different purposes. LoRa is used without a license. There's no cost to use it and it's an asynchronous protocol. So battery life is much larger for bat for devices and so is the cost. And the, the, the reach is several kilometers. The advantages of LoRa is the, the, the quality of the service that we can provide and the components of LoRa and LoRa One, which are part of the LoRa ecosystem are quite mature in Uruguay, are ready to be used. Some devices can be done privately or by private companies or public like service providers. In addition, narrow band IoT uses cellular technology based on synchronous protocols that are very timely and adequate for the quality of services. So we can really ensure great quality, but the battery lifetime does not compare to Dora's. One of the main advantages recommended in NB is that we can use for 4G or LTE, depending on the country and the service provider. And we don't really need an implementation from scratch, but we are updating whatever is available already. What this advantage is that it has to be provided by a service provider, a private uh, agent. Fox does not use a license either, but it is a proprietary technology at global level. It's a single provider. And of course, it is necessary to be installed in that country. So really, that's uh, very little experience with this protocol. Therefore, it's not very widely used. There are other IoT technologies like Zigbee, Bluetooth, Z-Wave, but they have a shorter scope and coverage. So it's really used in domestic networks, basically, and that would not be the case for a rural area, which is the subject of our investigation. So uh, narrow one IoT is feasible for a 4G LTE coverage, but not for rural areas, which is LoRa 1 or LoRa. LoRa really is the more adequate for those zones, where those areas where there is no coverage, low consumption, and we need really a more extended coverage and great battery life. The other objective, the software defined networks or SDN are defined in different layers. Their architecture is an agile network architecture designed to really maximize IT and centralized network infrastructure control in a software controller. Management is done independently from hardware. We have the controller as one of the components, which is the brain of the network, the application layer, where we're going to file all the applications being executed, and all of the infrastructure layer we will find all of the devices, network devices. The proposal is to use this new trend on a network trend to uh, an IoT network and to build from a legacy to an SD IoT. So it's an IoT, but software defined network. As you can see on screen, we use a platform that is called EdgeX, which is open source and is made up of different microservices in charge of receiving information coming from the sensors and delivering that information to the applications. Eggshake is an independent platform, independent from hardware, so it can be used on any device that are set, which is set as a, as a gateway. We have a service component in charge of managing different IoT protocols like the two Singa, LoRa, as I said before, and those that are not present can be customized as well. And then we have a different app service module that is basically used to extract and send the information to the uh, apps. And for example, we can say services to known clouds like Amazon, Google, Azure, IBM, etc or there's a process called MQTT or uh, HTTPS. I developed this project with a VREST app to interact between the application or among applications gateway, or if you need a different one, it can be developed as well. 
you have one minute left. Yes, I'm finished almost. The app is uh, Fiverr, which is uh, an app that allows us to have a more centralized management and automation of all of these gateways. And the architecture, as you can see on screen, has a lower part, which is the sensor, then the gateways that are distributed. And at the top, you can see the app. And the added value is the openness and programmability because we use open source platforms and it can be installed in any appliance. Redundancy because it can support sensor redundancy and status monitoring. We can uh, apply, have security at the gateway and communication so the configuration can be stored in our app. And to finish, let me just say that this uh, research is not done. And the next step is to uh, put it into practice and to really have a viable product. So any suggestions that you might have are more than welcome. And I hope you enjoyed my presentation. I'm open to any questions that you might have. Thank you, Maria Jesus. Actually, we have one question already. In the Q&A, we do, right? Yes, we do have some questions. We have two so far. Sebastian Espinosa says, how do you minimize the high latency in rural areas when using LoRa protocol? LoRa protocol is actually, or, or one of the main features of this protocol is that it has a, a higher latency than narrow band, band IoT. That's why, as I, as I said before, not all protocols can solve all of our problems, so to speak. But what LoRa allows us to do is that thanks to the very active community that, that is constantly developing new aspects worldwide. So there's a number of people who are active collaborators and active developers. So I think that latency on the, on the network will be improved little, little by little, maybe maybe changing how they modulate the, the signal or maybe some other uh, requirements in, in terms of the spectrum of the, of the devices themselves. Thank you, Maria Jesus. There was another question, but it was a, an anonymous attendee and we are asking people to please state your names when asking questions. So let's see if there are maybe other attendees who have more questions. We are still open for questions. Let's wait for a sec. In the meantime, let me remind you that Maria Jesus' presentation is also being uploaded to our site. You can download it, you can uh, check it out, and you can also see her contact information on her slides. Thank you. Oh, there's one more question. Oh, yes, we just got one question. Miguel Ignacio Strada wants to know which of these networks has been more widely adopted in our region? Actually, sort of depends. Laura, it's really quite developed in terms, well, in, in our region, in Argentina, in Brazil, and in Uruguay, we already have some LoRa cases, but really at private level. Narrow band IoT is being developed by service providers, of course. I know that in Uruguay, Antel, because I mean, this is public information and it's been posted on their website. We can see which coverage areas are already available for narrow band. And I think that there might be some services available in, in some areas if they, they, they see it as a feasible business. Otherwise, you would have to go for a smaller private solution and choose in LoRa. Do we have time for one more question? Yes. So Demian Pesile says, in terms of sensor uh, costs and local uh, hardware development, do you know if there is anything out there? In terms of costs, it kind of depends on the technology. Lower one is more affordable than NB, but from one to 100, let's say, to one to 100 scale, as narrow is based on cellular technologies, well, much more complex and much uh, more expensive to develop. 
we have Laura has developed some things, but I'm not sure if they have developed any sensors or gateways at local level. I know they do a lot of training. There's a, a maybe PhD dissertations or they have undertaken some pilot projects in Uruguay, but it can be done. It, it can be done. Of course, staff it's uh, uh or, or the costs in uruguay are a bit more expensive as there is a low, uh, lower scale than maybe a country that will have a larger development thank you uh, maria jesus yes damien uh then said that he was speaking about laura so you have answered his question so before moving on let me say that Miguel Ignacio Estrada also congratulates you and thanks you for your work. And I, I'm sorry, I was having some problem with my audio. I have one last question. Oscar Javier Cardenas Bernal says mobile infrastructure is sometimes not robust enough to get coverage in many areas in Latin America, or maybe we need more infrastructure. What do we need to invest in to make it reach further? If you're going to use the cellular network, it kind of depends on the service provider. And of course, you are dependent on the investment of service providers in each country. Now, if you are trying to reach areas where there is no coverage at all, you can use LoRa which will allow you for a wider and more affordable coverage and, and therefore access the, the sensors more remotely and, and, and at a lower cost. But actually, if you are based on a cellular network, well, you are really fully dependent on the on the server uh, on the service provider. There's nothing that individual private users can do in that sense. One last question. Charisol Castillo Kiel says your research is uh, related to the six low pan protocol. The protocol, what is the name of the protocol? I'm sorry, six low pan. I'm not familiar with that protocol. If you can maybe elaborate a little bit, I can. I can answer and, and, and let you know if it is related or not to our research. Could you elaborate a little bit further? Six, and it's spelled six, number six, L-O-W-P-A-N. Maybe Charisol can write you directly. Okay, so that was the last question. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Maria Jesus. Thank you, Mariela, for your questions. And we are now going to uh, a speaker that lives in the north, Giselle Carvajal. Giselle is from Cuba. She is an IT engineer and she developed uh, this work on automation of processes to monitor the technological infrastructure. And her mentor was Alvaro Retana. So Giselle, you have the floor. You can start. Hello, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me share the screen. So, as I was saying, good afternoon. I wanted to thank LACNIC for giving me this opportunity and my mentor, Alvaro Retana, who has uh, helped me. My work is uh, management uh, model and uh, availability control in the automation of a monitoring process of the technological infrastructure. And it sh gives us a guide that enables us to know how to monitor infrastructure with what resources and what processes require intervention in an IT operative, and what are the metrics that you need to measure to monitor the technological infrastructure. About a year ago, 
I was given the task of um, uh, um, at the time there were no companies that uh, they were so small for so that their infrastructure could not be seen. There, the uh, very few uh, human resources capable of giving responses uh, caused uh, the responses to be too slow, and uh, we didn't have any infrastructure available, and uh, we lacked uh, data. We couldn't uh, monitor the availability or manage the resources, and. Uh, uh, maintain the infrastructure. So that hindered the uh, growth of the infrastructure. So at the time, all that was a very difficult uh, task and not sustainable. As a result of this, we had to study and look for a solution that would offer us a guide to uh, take care of the infrastructure in a better way. So we chose a management model because it would help us contribute to improve the management, facilitate the administration and the control of resources available. It would provide objective and uh, timely information for decision-making to align uh, the technological infrastructure management with the strategic objectives of the entity so as to improve our services. The model that I proposed is designed in four stages, going from understanding the infrastructure, designing the proposal of a tools integration, and to the improvement, continuous improvement. So first you have to know the architecture, identify the tools and the skills of the human resources, identify the management needs, identify the levels of access to services and recognition of the capacities and the system range. During the design of the proposal for integration, we define the stages and the hallmarks for the implementation of models. We select the tools based on a number of characteristics. We identify the manageable processes or those that can be automated. We design a number of sets for the management system. We define the alert thresholds for each service. And finally, we model the process of availability management, uh, seeing the degree of observability. In the development and implementation stage, we configure the previously selected tools, we implement the services for the management process, and, or we, and we automate uh, the management processes that uh, make it that where, where it's possible. They integrate uh, the different levels in the network. And finally, we do the testing to identify any failures. In the fourth stage, we identify new processes, um, uh, automating the uh, new services based on the detection of the new metrics or monitoring, integrating new tools uh, coupled with the architecture of the network infrastructure. And finally, we integrate the management system with the proper tools. We have a distributed network designed to provide services from our offices. And in the context of COVID from our personal devices, we provide the services both for our workers and for the clients. Here you see the infrastructure. This is a hybrid uh, case that is in each of our offices. And besides for the personal devices, we give a connection with uh, that in the cloud to balance an automated uh, for an automated balance of the load and we could reduce the cluttering of the network uh, ensuring a fluent um, connection so and we independent of the route of access uh, that are used for that our solution monitor gsoft innovation is based on the model it, it uses uh, prometheus and uh, um, we use uh, grafana to reflect the metrics and taking into account each type of uh, service or server we use alert manager to send uh, warnings or alerts um, as configured and uh, run deck as a tool for the execution of uh, 
uh, so so that uh, the gates could be executed from a term from a, a, a terminal or the app it. we use a gate for uh, and um, The experience with, with this model enabled us to design a model capable of adapting to the growth of the number of servers to monitor with a different levels of uh, the uh, uh, network with the integrated management system. Why did we choose this model? Because it enabled, it has, it enables us to give an immediate response uh, when there are incidents independently of the human resources availability we reduce the time down of the infrastructure if it ever happens because we can anticipate the failures depending on how the infrastructure fails and we organize the human resources for to um depending on the importance of the tasks the the model um, makes it possible to develop uh, the principles that are more important for an sre um, uh, environment of high reliability. So the conclusions are that we managed to integrate a set uh, of tools in a model, increasing the infrastructure without uh, impairment of monitoring. And uh, we had the capacity to monitor the resources of the different levels of the network and the capacity to integrate the tools that are adequate to the mon to, for monitoring our infrastructure. Thank you. I don't know whether you have any questions. Thank you, Isel. Let's wait a second to see whether there are any questions and or comments in uh, the chat. Mariela, thank you, Laura. Yes, I'm paying attention to the Q&A, but please, if you have any questions, uh, put them in the chat and in the in the Q&A panel, not in the chat, please. I remind you that. Let's see if any of the attendees ask any questions here. Remember to use the Q&A panel. And we also remind you, as in the previous presentation, that you have the Discord to contact the people directly. I forgot to say today with uh, the previous presentation. Apparently, there are no questions, Laura. There is one in the chat. The person who asked it, uh, would you like to put it in uh, the Q&A panel? I don't know whether you can see it. Bueno, si... la puede poner por el Q&A. Can you put it in the Q&A panel? I she says that she can't. It's in Portuguese. Can you read it? Yes, yes, it's Vanessa's. It says, uh, congratulations for your talk, Giselle. You gave two uh, maps. Um, uh, you created two maps of the Grafana network and in the automatic jobs uh, server for alerts or do they uh, adopt uh, corrective actions? Thank you, Vanessa. The, what I understand of your question is that if we receive alerts through the network, the system is designed so that some jobs may be executed automatically. And in other cases, we receive the alerts through the different uh, channels, through Telegram, uh, mail, uh, Slack, and they are executed by whoever is on duty or the person in charge of that specific task in our working group. Well, thank you. There's one more question for Giselle in the Q&A panel by Natalia Sauchuk. 
possessed resale very good presentation what are the metrics you monitor and how regularly do you execute them hello thank you we define many different metrics in some cases it can be the cpu uh, load uh, or the servers with same adcls that we use for the infrastructure uh, here locally we monitor the load the traffic of the network to do the automated balance it's not to overburden one channel and as to how regularly we do it it also depends on the priority or the importance of the of monitoring that metrics in particular well thank you Gisela. that was the last question then thank you thank you Gisela. And I repeat that Giselle's presentation will also be available if you want to go through it and uh, contact her. So now we'll have the last speaker. It's Dalia Teran. She's from Colombia. She's an electronic and telecommunications engineer, and her mentor for this work was, was Natalia Sauchuk, and she will talk of uh, security analysis in ipv6 information networks in a virtualized environment so dalia you have the floor let's see now because uh, you were muted Good afternoon, Laura. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can uh, hear you and see you, but we don't see your screen yet. Yes, I'm about to share it. Ya se ve la presentación. Can you see the presentation there? Yes. Well, let me start by thanking you for your introduction and I wish everybody a good afternoon. According to LACNIC, at present, Colombia ranks 11th in the implementation of I in the deployment of IPv6 and it has a lower degree of development compared to other countries in Latin America and uh, the Caribbean. So there's still a gap in the adoption of the IPv6 protocol. And among the problems that we have identified is that the companies don't have a skilled staff and enough experience uh, to successfully implement IPv6 in terms of security, nor does Colombia have uh, any resources uh, to hire staff, they can't afford the, the, equip, the equipment. And IPv6 uh, deployment requires a very careful planning since this has an impact at on the servers, the apps uh, and security devices. All these, according to all these factors, there are many uh, different security problems since they can be exploited by ill-intentioned people through different hacking techniques. So to solve this problem, our project seeks to analyze security in networks, in IPv6 information, in a virtualized environment. As a reference model, we want to have a model that helps strengthen the adoption process of IPvC with security and minimize the um, exposure to attacks before actually deploying IPv6. To do so, we used a virtualized IPv6 network based on a design of a business uh, IAP with a management zone where we have the management for the network, a different zone where we have public servers of the entity, a third area where we will manage critical information of the 
organization and the internal network area where we are going to have each one for the different uh, areas of the organization, financial IT or users. Then we have a level three switch that uh, plays a role as a core of the network to allow or restrict access between the different zones of the organization. And then we have a firewall to connect users to the internet network. This scenario was implemented through GNS3, is one of the most well-known, and allows connection and uh, the use of VMware by integrating different virtual uh, machines and conversion of the different distributions. Debian for the first area and Ubuntu 20 for the MZ area. For the communication equipment, I used IOS with IPVC support of Cisco. And for the attacking machine, I used the Kali Linux distribution. We we have the IPv6 virtualized plan using the prefix 2801.15.9534 bar 48 and network segmentation using ID sub network and the first part to identify the area of the organization. A, internal network, B, management, C, M, Z, D, D, M, Z, and E, for uh, point to point. And the second part to identify the number of the sub area, 350, 250, 150, 60, 70, and 80. Then we did a testing plan with five concept tests in the data collection information. We did a process scanning or recognition. And then in the penetration phase, we did four tests, IPv6 spoofing, service denial, network sniffing, and POC MITM. For each one, we describe the technique used, the tool, the execution, the uh, target network, and the countermeasures, as you can see here on screen. But since I very have very limited time in my presentation, I cannot go more in depth. In the IPVC spoofing, our objective was to hide and um, supplement the IPVC, uh, the origin address. As we can see here, we have the attacker in the remote network that is posing as a false router, creating this uh, fake IPVC address. There we have a web server connected be before the border router with the address 180. So what we do is send requests to the web server. And on this side, the victim side, we filter with the TCP tool, the incoming message from ICMP6128. As we can see, the server receives the echo requests originated with the address of the attacker. Considering this, the attacker will then prepare to do a service denial tests. For these tests, we use the denial six tool in order to clash the service of the web uh, service for that entity. We use the package flooding technique as we can see the IC MPv6, we can see how many requests were received by the web server sent from the fake uh, IP address of the attacker. And as a result, we're going to see that the e uh, IPv6 Colombia website will be denied. Now to for service denial, attacks, we use the countermeasure URPF in the entry interface of the router is S10. With this command, the router will check the origin address of the packages and will only send packages and if the origin address can be reached through the interface received. We also created an ASL with log assigned to URPF, so these uh, can be saved in the log. The denied packages can be saved. With the show self int command, we are checking that this has gone through the interface. By doing 
by attacking again, we can see the router denies the request coming from the fake address through the S10 interface targeting the victim D80180. In this way, both the internal and external network users can have access to the IPVC uh, Colombia site. In the sniffing test for IPv6, we did from a user VLAN 150 and the server of the application with Wireshare, we collected the traffic transmitted between the client and the server through SSH. This could be very dangerous because if it's not set up correctly as a service, an attacker could exploit vulnerabilities to really steal confidential information from that app. As a countermeasure, we implemented ePaySec in at both ends of the communication using strong swan uh, tool to do so i restarted the ipc service in both ends of the communication and as we can see we established one ep6 host to host using a pre-shared key and by Doing it with Wider, we observed that the communication channel between two ends with IP6 was done through the ESP protocol. You have one minute in order to protect the exchange. To the man in the middle test, we did it from the P250 uh, to the switch core. So the attacker will alter the messages by diverting traffic to themselves in the you can see that the addresses were supplanted were changed with the address of the attacker we recommend using port security as a security measure at the strict at level two to avoid unwanted connections in our equipment or port so if we look at the switch list, we can see that we blocked the MAC address of the attacker through the U3 port. And finally, as a conclusion, we can say that when we have a service generation attack using fake addresses, we're going to use the URPF countermeasure applied at the frontier firewall. For sniffing attacks, we are going to use IP6 at both ends of the communication to protect. And the uh, man in the middle test, we are going to use as a countermeasure port security and using uh, Cisco switch. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. And there you can see my contact information. Thank you, Dalia. So we will open up the floor for questions. Laura, we have here one comment. Henry Godoy says, congratulations for your work and exploring all potential scenarios. And he says, your work is a great because it shows what many people think about that we have no security problems with IPv6. Now we have the same attack potential on IPv6 than IPv4. Thank you, Henry. Actually, you are right. People usually think that we need to 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 write a, a, a rerouting plan on IPv4. Now, many people think that we do not need to use the same solution. Now we're going to use different tools, but as you can see, we use strong one and there are many tools that we can use with IPv6 and really open source tools to try to prevent this type of attack. Dalia, Laura, are there any further questions? Actually, there's one more. One more, okay. Laura, you can see them before I can, I think. Okay, the last question is uh, Sebastian Espinosa says, congratulations. The equipment used in the simulation are Cisco or could it be any generic brand? Would strategies work the same? Equipment that we use or IOS manufacturing were Cisco, but the advantage is that 
it is a multi-platform network simulator that can be integrated both with Juniper equipment or it is also feasible for the countermeasures, not only for Cisco, Huawei and Portinet, based on the research that I did, but I actually used Cisco. And if you want further information on my on my last slide, you can uh, you can look it up because really we want people to, to train in for the penetration tests and also really be able to understand the countermeasure to be applied for each of the scenarios. Laura, we have one final question, but I don't know if we have time. I think we do have one minute. Okay, John Velasco says, is there something to be mentioned with regards to IPv6 usability? There are many threats. As a basic attack of IPv6 stands, I don't really understand what he means. I don't know if you can make sense out of it, Dahlia, or should we ask maybe John to contact sí. you directly? I think that he says that we can attack through IPv6 by using fragmentation attacks. attacks. That's why this scenario is a baseline really where we can use more attack techniques and therefore use different countermeasures among those, the one that the John mentioned, but of course you can email me, Dalia Teran at unicauca.edu.co. Great, thank you. Yes, we can see that your contact information and your email address is actually in the, in the chat box. So nothing further on my end. Dalia, thank you. Well, I want to thank you and really help, uh, really thank you for your help and support to the mentoring program. Thank you all. Great, Dalia, thank you. And thank you to all of the attendees that have joined us for our last session of the technical forum. I will now give the floor back to Andrea.